You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. In 1964, an issue of Life magazine ran with Roy Lichtenstein in the cover. The text read, Is he the worst artist in the U.S.? Lichtenstein responded to criticism of his work, saying, I think my paintings are critically transformed, but it would be difficult to prove it by any rational line of argument. I love this because it, it it seems like just the weakest defense ever. He's just like, basically, I think my work's good, but there's no logical reason for anyone to agree with me. It's a bold move. I'll give him that. I feel like who art ed? Who art is? Well, Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me once again, I've got my good friend, musician, artist, doer of all the things, um, the real Michael Lee. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me back, man. I appreciate it. No, I, I thought this was perfect because it's it's almost like a two-parter. In our, our first mm-hmm. episode that we recorded together, we talked about Jack Kirby. I mean, yeah. the legend of comic book art. And today we're talking about Roy Lichtenstein, the legend of copying comic book art. Yes. I, <laughs> I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Roy Lichtenstein with all of his all of his talent and I, I will say he is talented. Oh very. He was on the cover with the the heading posing the question, is he the worst artist in America? Yes. When he first hit the scene, when he first hit it big, I mean he was seen as like a hack. Like even though what he was doing was definitely not that. I mean he was elevating art and what he saw as art, but when he first hit the scene, people were like, what is this? This is not art. Well, I'm I'm just I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think today there are still a lot of people who are uncomfortable with what he did and would oh, yeah. would say he's a hack. I mean, he was he's largely criticized for directly copying work, but if you look more carefully, he's not exactly copying it. Oh yeah, not at all. Um I mean, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, yeah. but I think a little <laughs> bit of uh foreshadowing is always good. So to get back to the beginning with Roy Lichtenstein, though, Roy Lichtenstein was born October 27th, 1923. He's from New York, as I don't know, like every American artist seems to have been. Um, He had like a middle class upbringing. It looks like his father worked in real estate. His mom was a homemaker. And he is he enjoyed art as kind of a hobby like all of us do who have the greatest elementary art teacher in the history of the world um that's just for like the one of my students who listens you know like he's he's taking classes he he did some some studying and had a talent for art Mm -hmm. he really loved jazz which I, i i don't know i I don't want to call him a liar, but it's hard to imagine anyone actually loved <laughs> jazz. I mean, jazz is the music you like to say you love, you want to love it, but it's it's so rarely enjoyable. Well, is that just me? No, is it, no. Is it my bad taste? Jazz is a very, how can I put this and, and be very diplomatic about it? I mean, I you like don't jazz. don't have to be. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, I do like jazz for the theory behind it and what it all does for music. There's a flow and a connection to, I'd say, everything. Jazz is this, uh, this. I, I you know what? I can't even. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you can't explain it pretty much explains it. I want to like it uh, yeah. because of the theory behind it, but uh, it's the eat your vegetables of music. It it's, is. And I, could, it, I couldn't even form a cohesive thought about it. <laughs> who needs to form a cohesive thought? We're on a podcast. It's cool. <laughs> um, but he would go to the jazz clubs and he would draw. You know, he'd go to the Apollo Theater, mm-hmm. listen to people, and draw the musicians. So he was the guy creating visual art in an audio venue. I, I don't know what kind of ridiculous person would 
go to an audio medium for the visual <laughs> arts, but whatever. So as a teenager, he goes to the Art Students League in New York. I mean, Art Students League, so many great names came out of there, George O'Keefe, among others. And he studied under Reginald Marsh. Uh, he was like a social realist, which like I think of um, – are you familiar with his work? I actually um, – based on your notes, I looked him up here, and I have some of his uh, pieces here. He – to me, a lot of his art feels – it feels very American. Um, like when you think of like American art, like I'm looking at um, – one piece here where these these uh it's Battery Park, um and there's there's a steamboat behind in the background and they're kind of walking out along the um I don't want to say shore but the edge of the, the river here. I'm not too familiar with New York, so I really apologize to the New York folks yeah. out there if I'm messing this up. They're probably screaming at your podcast right now. That's wrong. <laughs> um, but that's it, all like, anybody does when they listen to my podcast. Is oh. They they scream at their device that it's wrong, as if I can hear them <laughs> on the other side. If you want to comment that it's wrong, you can at me on Twitter or you know go to Good Pods and leave a comment on 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 their message boards. <laughs> but um, yeah, like you say, it, it has this American feel. It, it's very energetic, I feel it like, is. too. It's these like street scenes, mm-hmm. um, which I find kind of interesting because of like when I look at an artist and I start to look at who did they study from, who were their influences, I don't see much of, of this in Lichtenstein's work. I mean, Lichtenstein seemed to go through this evolution mm-hmm. where he was pulling from all these different places but like what he's best known for is is so different from what his early work and his roots and his training seemed to be oh yeah yeah like like marsh i feel like is kind of a mashup of like diego rivera and ernie barnes a little Mm. bit you know um but moving on from there he goes off to ohio state 1940 and he studies art, he studies literature, botany, history. I mean, he's just studying everything, really. Yeah. And then, like every other able-bodied person, he is contributing to the war effort in 1943. He gets drafted. Um, and I didn't realize until I was doing research, I guess he later went to DePaul in Chicago to yeah. study – engineering as a part of that training to be like a a military draftsman so as much as like he's later on in his career sort of like maligned or dismissed for doing comic book illustration type stuff i mean like the dude had some serious chops as a as an artist and a draftsman i mean he he kind of flowed around before the war and after too, which I don't want to jump the gun. We'll get to that. That's fine. But I mean, his time at at uh, OSU was huge. That's where he met Hoyt Sherman, who was hugely influential on him and start and planted that seed of you know what is art, what makes art good. Like how come I like this one but you don't, and how come you do not consider this one fine art, even though I like it, I think it should be. And that's where that whole that whole ethos that affected his entire career later on was was first formed. And I, I do want to actually I know this is getting a little bit off topic and away from from our notes and what we talked about. But I you you brought up that question that was planted in the seed by Sherman of what is art? Yeah. And that is one of those things that. I feel like a lot of people have a hard time defining, Mm -hmm. especially like in a postmodern era. Yeah. How do you define art? Because most people, they come up with art as like through examples. Art is paintings, art is sculpture. But Mm -hmm. like, you know, when I when I go to Home Depot and get a a gallon of paint and just make it beige on the wall, is that really art? You know, so like, how do you define it? For me, it's, it's as simple as did you make something? Did you create something, anything? So I actually, um, a few months ago, I started doing this thing just to keep the brain going and that always thinking is create something a day, mm-hmm. anything a day. It could be a line of a lyric. Um, it can be something simple, a sketch, what have you. Um, it could be 
notes for a, a Dungeon and Dra- Dungeons and Dragons campaign for my son. You know, yeah. stuff like that. We we get it. You're a nerd. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, that is accurate. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, I, I I'm making something. I'm making something for either myself or somebody else. But something is being created by my mind, and to me, that constitutes art. Anything could be art. Having a graphic design background, being a huge Andy Warhol fan, you know, I I know anything can be art. Yeah, art's whatever you can get away with, as Warhol said. <laughs> Truth. Um, I yeah, I I have always liked that. Uh, you know, you talk about creating. I I've I've always explained it as it's the product of creativity. Mm-hmm. Just because you know, to me, I think like like you're getting at there. That creativity is at the heart of it. And that's where Lichtenstein has always been, I'm going to be honest, it's always been a little bit of a challenge for me. Mm. Uh, at least his his best known works, because it feels so directly based on other people's creative vision. Um, and we'll get into that more with the, we'll get the, into that more with the, the analysis uh, for Look Mickey later on. Mm-hmm. But getting back to sort of his story and his development, you said he kind of bounced around. He's looking for work. It, mm-hmm. One of the things that people often miss about the arts is it's a job. Yep. It's a fun job, but it's a job. And he's trying to think about, like, how can I make a living off this? He sees yeah. some moderate success doing stuff in – the 1950s, the abex mu- movement, um, abstract expressionism, j- think Jackson Pollock, splatter paintings, all of that, that was like the big movement on the scene. Like Willem de Kooning was the top dog of the art scene and making abstract expressionist movements, the giant oversized gestural stuff. Mm-hmm. And he was doing a little bit of that. And I think... Um, I think he also did he dabbled a little bit in cubism right yes he did yeah yeah he uh, he was a huge fan of picasso i mean he is he was quoted as saying guernica was his favorite piece like ever which yeah. is huge to say it's also a huge painting so no pun intended there but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um you yeah, know he dabbled around i mean he as you mentioned he was trying to find his footing in that and he tried to go where where the market was Exactly. So he was when he was in Ohio after he well, after the war, he went to France. He tried going to France to be like, I'm going to be an artiste, you know, gets there. He's there for three months. And unfortunately, his father falls ill. So he goes back home. So he's like, well, I'm home. Okay, I can't afford to go back to France now. I've got to find work. So he actually gets a teaching job and then meets his wife. Uh, They they start their, you know, their little life there. And he's starting to. He, he is he's he's painting in that I believe during this uh, time period or shortly thereafter he made look Mickey uh, don't want to jump the gun there but we'll get to that yeah. but he uh you know he, he's he's thinking like okay how can I make a career out of this so he in Ohio he notices that in New York he's selling paintings like he's he's actually making a little bit of scratch off of these not much but he's like okay well there's something there so let's move out there he ends he ends up moving out to this other college, gets a job out at this place. And it's kind of a conservative college like he was dealing with in Ohio. Not much of an art scene. He was just kind of languishing there, just like just doing his art, uh, you know, putting his nose to the grinder kind of thing. You know, and then then he's like, I got to get to New York. Like, this is not working for me. You know, so then he ends up getting another job at this other college. And he ended up that's at Rutgers, when the floodgates I believe. Open. Yeah. Rutgers is where he he sort of landed and found some success and and yes. then like while he's at Rutgers that's where he starts to meet other artists that would become bigger names like that's where he starts to meet people like Klaus Oldenburg mm-hmm. um I think Warhol was in the scene at that time too Yeah Warhol's just coming up at the same time yeah and actually the the uh, manager who got him, or rep, whatever it's called in the art world, apologies to all the uh, fine <laughs> artists out there who are once again yelling at your uh, your your your, your, um, 
phone or whatever listening to this. <laughs> but um, yeah, he met his his, the, his new rep there, and that guy actually passed over Warhol for Lichtenstein. Like Warhol and one other person were in the running with Lichtenstein for this guy. He picked Lichtenstein, and then that's when his career just kind of boom exploded. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of interesting because Warhol and Lichtenstein very similar mm-hmm. end results in a lot of ways where oh, they yes. were taking these appropriated images and transferring them, enlarging them, all of that. Mm-hmm. But I feel like their process was very different. Oh, very different. I would say Lichtenstein was much more hands-on. Um, Warhol, obviously famous for his screen printing in that. Um, but yeah, I mean, Lichtenstein, his process was... That took a while because he first had to he, he trace the whatever image he was doing, say, with look, Mickey, he was tracing you know, Mickey. And then he'd um, he'd take that and then he'd tweak it as needed for whatever he the narrative that he was trying to put forth in this piece. And then he'd actually project it onto the canvas, sketch it there, then paint it like it was not an easy like, you know, plop the screen print down, you know, do the uh, squeegee over it and boom million dollar art piece (laughs) yeah and one thing i do want to just expand on and clarify a little bit there because you said he he would trace those images he would trace from the projection of his sketch but if you look very carefully a lot of his stuff was it's not a direct copy it's modified Mm -hmm. a little bit whereas with andy warhol he was like Andy Warhol said he wanted to be a machine. He wanted yeah. his process to be as automated as possible. And so he would do like photo transfers and things yeah. like that to the screen. Whereas Lichtenstein was doing things in a much more old school way, but new subject matter. And I think the difference there is Warhol came from a graphic design background. So, I mean, he's, I mean, he's making art for, I mean, it, uh, f- um, for money. I mean, not not for respect and all that, but to you know show a can of soup, you know, and sell that can of soup, you know, to make money for somebody else. And it's a very mechanical world, you know, because you, you gotta think, okay, I gotta, I gotta sell this can of soup. How am I gonna do it? Okay, I got piece all these things together. Boom, get out the door. Next one in. But Liechtenstein, he had more of a, um, a fine art background that wasn't so into the design world the graphic design world so he had i'll say a more of a reverence for it than warhol did based on him not sitting at it at, at that time a drafting desk and putting these ads together yeah i mean you in the fine arts world you're not supposed to you're supposed to pretend that you don't care about money, right? Oh, yeah. So you're yeah. supposed to you're supposed to say like, "Oh, I'm just I, it's a labor of love. I'm just doing all this. I'm I'm in my studio, focused on the paint and see what the paint says and and does to me. And as inspiration comes yeah. or whatever, and and then sell that one work of art for an obscene amount of money. <laughs> but um, I mean, the economics of it are are, are a little bit bonkers. Andy yeah. Warhol was more transparent about that. Oh yeah. But I, I think it is worth noting, like, it's it's a very different way of getting at a very similar l- looking p- end result. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, ironically, because Andy Warhol was playing with the colors, people perceived his as, like, totally radically different yeah. um, and transformed by that because he started to do, like, uh, a rainbow-striped zebra or whatever it was, you know? <laughs> and... In this process, like we say, we kind of left off at, at his story as around 1960, mm-hmm. he is starting to make inroads in the scene. He's getting to know the pop artists who would later become like the biggest names. I mean, the pop art movement was just getting started at this was, phase. Yeah. So this seems like a good time for us to transition into discussion of one of his pieces. And I want to talk about... Uh, the first painting that he did ripping from a comic book or from a a picture book, an illustration directly. I I absolutely love this story that the inspiration behind look Mickey 
came because his son was basically taunting him. His son was like, was saying like he could never paint something as good as uh, what's the name of the book? It was uh, it was a Donald Duck. Donald Duck lost and found. So his son's looking at the book, points out this illustration and says, Dad, you could never draw something this good. <laughs> and basically Roy Lichtenstein developed his career and his style for spite. Just to stick it to his child, he paints this giant oil on canvas. Uh, it's like four feet by four feet by five, almost yep. six feet. Uh, um, let's see, forty-eight inches by sixty-nine inches, according to uh, National Gallery of Art. Yeah. So now, as we're looking at this, what are you seeing? What's jumping out at you? Well, it's it's a very cheeky piece. Uh, again, no pun intended there. As <laughs> Mickey is, um, as Donald stif- has has hooked his own cheeks. Yes, and you know Mickey is stifling his giggles there um, as he's staring at Donald's uh, feathered bum. <laughs> um, but I mean, one thing that sticks out for me, and this is this is. I don't know if this is just my design background or what have you, but I'm looking at like how it's made. And he's this is pre Ben Day dot Lichtenstein, his his um mm-hmm. his signature almost with his pieces. And it's not as mechanical as like as his later work was. Yeah, I, I I would agree. This this feels like it's less directly copied than mm-hmm. his later ones. Um as I as I look at it, I mean Mickey and Donald actually look a little bit um a little bit deformed in yes. his rendering. I mean, I hate to say it, but his son may have been right. He couldn't <laughs> draw them as well as Walt Disney did. Or well, I, uh, I, I, I or uh you know, <laughs> like I, I will the say, Disney illustrator. I will say Mickey cannot pull off the uh the collared shirt with the short sleeves. Um I, I think Walt Disney was maybe uh right in uh in not giving him a, a top uh and the pants like i don't know i don't know if this was Lichtenstein's uh just putting it on there to avoid uh getting sued by walt disney but um <laughs> yeah there's 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 um and also looking at this as we're studying it and kind of you know we're poking fun at it in that a little bit but there's also a a very sketch like quality to it like he filled in a sketch that he had done i mean it, it's it's raw almost to me and how it, how it's put together yeah, it it does feel a little bit sketchy and yet very neat and precise at the same time. Yeah, like the the waves in the water, like the ripples and that down there are very like, oh, that that was seems well thought out and the rest of it's like like the the, the um how Mickey's ears are colored in that. It's very it's rough almost. Like it's like okay, it's just done, you know, filled in and get it done and show it to my son say, "Say, see, this is art." I did it (laughs) on some level. It almost feels like um, it almost feels like a print that's missing one of the colors or something. Yeah. Like it it feels like it's been through a couple of passes. And I guess for, for an audience that's not familiar, I I should clarify some things. You referenced Ben day dots before Mm. and Ben day dots are the dots of different colors that would be used. Um, when we talked about impressionism and pointillism, we know those artists would create with little dots of color put together that the eye would blend. And cheaper methods of printing mm-hmm. for especially comic books, it was very common to have relatively large, visible, noticeable dots of each of those colors. And um, the primary colors used for printing there would be cyan, magenta, and yellow. So you've got kind of a, a blue uh, magenta is sort of a pinkish red, and yellow is a yellow. Um, and then black would be the fourth. It's technically not a primary. It's just black would be the fourth color used because it's cheaper than to mix all of the colors and make a black ink. Yeah. Um, and so what he's done is he has reduced this to essentially the primaries. Mm-hmm. And I'm as I'm looking carefully, I'm not really seeing a black. And maybe that's what feels like it's missing. Maybe, yeah. I mean, he he was he was known for using a base set of colors throughout 
much of his earlier work. He did break from that later on. Um, but, you know, to start, it was very simplistic, as you mentioned, this low, um, um, low tech printing style of comic art with the Bende dots, which now they still use, they actually do use the dots in a number of things, like a uh, flexographic printing still uses them, but everything else is digital now. Um, but yeah, back then, I mean, that was what they had to work with. So when he's putting this together, he, I mean, he's kind of filtering it through his own mind in that. But yeah, there's without the black in here, it does give the, it's this interesting low tech sketch quality to it that it feels unfinished. It really does. Yeah. It, like I said, it, it feels to me like it needs another pass of another mm-hmm. color. Um, because in if you're doing like handmade printing, screen printing especially or something like that, you would basically set up a screen in each color and then you would print one color and then you would line up the screen on top of that. You have kind of registration marks to help you with the alignment and everything, but it's basically printing on top of a print on top of a print to add more colors. And this feels like it's missing one of them. Yeah. It feels like it's it's partially completed, although it's oil on canvas it's hand painted um and the composition we see we see donald duck looking over the edge of a pier and he's got the fishing pole in his hand and he feels like he's got a big one it it actually says look mickey i've hooked a big one which is not in the original source material um the source material the book i looked up the actual image that that we had there there was no speech bubble in the original so that's one of the modifications that that lichtenstein made he actually chose to add the speech bubble here and then he simplified the background because in the initial disney illustration you know we see some trees and people walking in the background behind mickey and yeah. here it's just like water, yellow and white pier with blue outlines and then like a yellow sky, sort of just empty negative space there. Yeah, he completely changed the angle of that pier. It was coming in, it's uh, still coming in from the right hand side, but instead of being um, top to bottom, it's uh, the lower corner up into the uh, heading towards the upper left corner there interesting change but looking at it composition wise though i mean with what he took out and put back in it makes sense and i really love one thing i just noticed as i was looking at this and this is just my personal thing i love how he put the bobber right there in that speech bubble Mm -hmm. it just kind of ties donald and the speech bubble all together and creates this little circle right there that i just absolutely love that's just me speaking personally yeah, I, I see that. And it's one of those little things that that comes in in the choices that he's making. I mean, we talk about the the speech bubble there. I mean, adding the speech bubble gives you the necessary information mm-hmm. because without that speech bubble, like Donald looks nuts. Yeah. Right. We don't understand <laughs> what's going on there without that text. I mean, mm-hmm. the text was separated on the page and he realized for this image, for this joke to work, he needs that. Yeah. And there's something I I really like about that circular movement on Donald and his fishing pole. Yeah. Um visually, just like the circular pathway for my eye to follow is nice, but then also like it, it's just a pleasing eye movement the way that the the arc of the bottom of donald's jacket so nicely mirrors the arc of the fishing pole going up like it's it's a just a wonderful ellipse there and i think that's part of the modification that he's making to the this image is it just creates a, a better visual pathway but then it's also kind of interesting like metaphorical it just it feels like there's this circular logic of postmodernism and just navel gazing here yeah you know like it feels in some way a commentary on the art world and the hype of everything that he is calling out to seem sort of absurd i, I mean we've got donald 
is literally pulling something out of his butt saying, look, Mickey, I've got a big one or something like that. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And in some ways, like as the viewer, it feels like I'm looking at this and laughing at it. But at the same time, it's in a gallery. And in some ways, it's like the jokes on us, the jokes on the art world, the jokes on everyone. Oh, and he was I mean, he he ended up becoming known for that. Like he parodied. Uh, I, lo- I love this. This piece, his brushstrokes series where he's uh, he's parodying Jackson Pollock, like this super serious like these. My brushstrokes are a window to my soul and, and and have this huge deep meaning and then he goes and simplifies it down makes it look mechanical and says oh look this is art too hello like he, he's him just poking fun at the art world the art world's as you put it navel gazing is just i mean he built a career out of that when I mean, you see pictures of him one thing i noticed when, when researching him is you see his pictures he's got this impish smile like he's always got this little like you know smirk to his face and and uh, watching uh, some interviews like with his son and that, like he loved what he did and he found joy in everything he did. And he was always like this little imp, just like, oh, what can I do now? Kind of thing. Like he, I, I absolutely love that in an artist. Yeah, because in, in some ways his work is, it's very meta. It's very mm, like very. art about art. Um, Mm -hmm. and about the art world, which in some ways I think is, it's funny because the pop art movement, so many people associate with trying to make art more accessible and Mm -hmm. getting away from the pretensions of like the ABEX movement and everything like that and embracing what had previously been quote unquote low culture and everything like that with taking subject matter from popular culture. But at the same time, he's doing it in this way that is a little bit of a wink and a nod Mm -hmm. that insiders will also get certain references. Oh yeah. He's using that pretension as a tool to elevate this art. I mean, he, I mean, like, as we mentioned before, he very much, you know, believed that anything can be art and that he he gravitated towards comic art and commercial art and sought to lift that up into the realm of fine art, doing the air quotes here. Uh, but, I mean, he he very, very much used that as a tool to to get his point across. And I think he did it incredibly well. Yeah, and I think also one of the things about this sort of one of the things about the pop art movement and why I like this particular piece as an example of pop art is because it gets at that shift from like the modern to the postmodern philosophy. Mm hmm. Modernism, at least by my understanding of it, was largely about trying to get down to something sort of raw to get to the timeless and universal. Like think Jackson Pollock breaking art down to just line, texture, color, and an expressive composition. Or Piet Mondrian breaking it down into just the primary colored squares and rectangles because they thought – These are the things that will never go out of style, that everybody can understand and appreciate. And the postmodern idea was basically there is nothing that's timeless and universal because everything is filtered through your own lens of experience and culture and all of that sort of stuff. And the pop art movement really embraces that. And so what he starts to do is take these images that are already out there in the ether and says like, well, you know, if if a painting of, you know, figures from from history, Washington crossing the Delaware are important and tell us something about society – maybe these other cultural artifacts are subjects that are worthy of study. And what does Mickey and Donald tell us about this? And in some ways the answer is a duck is, is grabbing his own butt. Like, (laughs) you know, like in, in some ways it, it, it's calling out some, some vapid, shallow and laughable parts of culture. Oh Yes. But then at the same time, it's like, you know, 
there is something serious underneath that too. Mm-hmm. And it, it's weird that it, it occupies both spaces to me. It, it does. And he, he always straddled that line. I mean, he would turn this, you know, these things into what I'd say is cliche. Like later on in his, um, his, his, his work in the nineties, he did an entire room as a painting and he turned reality into a cliche which I mean, I love that, and now we're to a point. I actually love those those installations. Oh yeah, they're so cool, and like, and now we're to a point with society that like, what Liechtenstein was doing, especially with like his his room installations and that turning reality into cliche, is done now through something like like TikTok, where it's a video of somebody. You got these filters and that, and they're changing it and just turning it into this thing that. People just take for granted because it's there and it's silly and weird, but it's reality now. Yeah. And I mean, like I say, the pop art movement was sort of the cutting edge of looking at life and culture and examining the filters that we're using and the lenses Mm -hmm. that we're using and acknowledging them and holding those artifacts up as something worthy of study. Yeah. And, you know, as much as he embraced comic book styling – he wasn't actually like a comic book enthusiast. Oh yeah, no. Which I find like, kind of interesting. Yeah, he he just liked the idea behind it of it being this mechanical art that people saw as inferior. Same thing with um advertising art. I mean, his um piece Drowning Girl was from an ad for like some uh, some cabin or lo- or lodge or something like that. And he took it and, you know, tweaked it a bit and put it on the wall and said, "Hello art." You know, same thing with um I wonder if his son was behind that too. I wonder if they were like <laughs> driving and and they saw a billboard and his son was like, "I bet you can't draw that." <laughs> I just like to imagine that Roy Lichtenstein's entire career was based on spite. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was. So, I mean, he was taking like stuff like instructions for um, like shoe fitting a shoe, shoe fitting device and changing that and putting it on canvas. And, you know, to, to cap to cap that entire idea off, he always he was quoted as saying that he was always surprised that people bought his used canvases like he in a <laughs> way had this. I, he knew what his art was, but what in what he was doing. And it's like, well, I'm making this. I'm set, telling you it's art. Do I believe it's art? Yeah, probably, because I'm making it. I'm selling it to you. But if you buy it, that's on you. You don't have to. But please do. <laughs> I like I I love the fact that he referred to his his paintings as used canvases. Yes, I when I heard that quote, I'm like that is that that's just chef's kiss, perfect for Liechtenstein. Like that's peak Liechtenstein right there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm wrapping it up. I, I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Louvre is this something to look at? The lab, the lab. is this something to learn from? Or the loot. British for the bastard. Yeah. There's a the loot joke in there yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I, th- you know, I'm going to say all three. I think it works in all three of them. Now, right now, it's hanging in the National Gallery of Art. Um, but I think it also could be above the toilet. It's a silly thing. Like, it, uh, <laughs> it works in multiple locations that have vastly different ideas of what should be hanging there. <laughs> yeah, I think um I I was kind of thinking along the same lines because I was thinking, you know, you like Liechtenstein, so I was trying to think the case against him or against it being in the museum. <laughs> and you know, for me this is a piece to learn from. I think mm-hmm. that's probably where I ultimately land because I think there is something really interesting at all the layers and nuances to it and the references Mm -hmm. and what that says about art and consumerism and the culture that's producing it and the breakdown between the high and the low and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think there is something interesting about Liechtenstein, particularly Mm -hmm. as an artist who started off in let's face it, the very much modern art world. And yep. then he is this bridge to the postmodern yeah. in a lot of ways. And I think Look Mickey is is a good piece to learn from because it's sort of the transitional piece it is. that I, I see where it's it's got a it's got a little bit in different columns. Um and I 
I put it in the lab to learn from because I don't like to look at it. There's something <laughs> off about it. There's something unsettling to me about it. And and I think it's I think it's the color scheme. And I don't have a problem with the primary color scheme, but it feels like it's lacking something. I think mm. if it had maybe if it had the black in there. Yeah, the the shading depth or something like that. Yeah, without without the the shading and the black, like you, it's very very flat. And as you know, a trained artist who trains other artists, budding artists, you know, you're used to seeing you know seeing the depth in something, and this does not have that. Yeah, and and it's got some of the conventions of the style, but not all of them, because. Yeah. Because they're like the uh, original illustration is much more, it's like a watercolor. And, you know, even with the comic book styling, there's the typical black outline that pulls mm-hmm. it forward in the picture plane. This feels like everything's equal weight, nothing's all that forward. It's also, I just actually just noticed this too. It's missing the motion lines from the original one. But despite that, it has a weight to it that. Uh, helps it along despite its shortcomings with the lack of depth and the simplicity of it. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's good. It's a good piece to learn from, but it feels like he's not quite there yet in yeah. developing his style, which, you know, through the lens of hindsight, he wasn't quite there yet in developing oh, yeah, his style, but he did stick it to his child. So he did. <laughs> As a dad, gotta give respect for that. And now it's you know, <laughs> this this spiteful uh piece of art is hanging in the National Gallery of Art and millions can see it every day and enjoy it. <laughs> I, I you know, I, I wonder if anyone will ever put together like a curated collection a gallery showing of just like spite pieces like pieces <laughs> that someone made because someone else said they couldn't oh, that, that is great. that is a collection i would love to see maybe that's a series i should do like a mini series or a, oh, yeah. a fun fact episode just a listicle of like pieces that were made for spite <laughs> um but <laughs> I appreciate that you came here, not for spite, but because you are a genuinely awesome human being. Uh, oh, the you. real Michael Lee. Thank you very much. I'm going to link all your socials in the show notes. Um, but for those who don't read my show notes, shame on you. Um, everything you've got is up at therealmichaellee.com, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. Or um, if uh, that's a little too long for you, uh, bit.ly slash here, T-R-M-L, uh, B-I-T dot L-Y slash H-E-A-R-T-R-M-L. Uh, you can also find all my links there as well. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much once again. I appreciate you coming out to talk a little Liechtenstein with me. Well, thanks for having me again. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.